Hello, welcome back to Bike Fit Tuesdays. Today we are covering five Bike Fit blunders, things that people do to self medicate, which might not be the best way of going about it. Are you ready? It's been a while. It's been like a month, hasn't it? But every month? Do the viewers want like Bike Fit content every month? I think they want it every day. It's a bit boring, isn't it? So a very common blunder that we see in here is uh, riders applying quite a lot of pitch to their saddles as a means of uh, removing saddle issues or genital issues. Now there are quite a lot of problems associated with this, firstly destabilizes the pelvis. But the most important thing that, to understand is that when you apply a lot of pitch to a saddle, you create a slope. Now, what happens when we put something on a slope? That's how stable your pelvis is. The idea was to drop the nose of the saddle to take pressure away from the genitals and soft tissue areas uh, in the middle of the pelvis. Uh, however, I personally prefer using a saddle that has a pressure relief channel. The other issue that this tends to result in is riders tend to gravitate towards the nose of it. Now, the nose is a very unsupported, very narrow part of the saddle, isn't really going to offer you a huge amount of support and stability. It's also going to result in a lot of weight on the front of the bike. So you quite often see people kind of bracing with their arms, hands, and neck and shoulders because they're falling off the front of the saddle. So if you're having soft tissue problems, like genital numbness, that kind of stuff, uh, the best way to remedy it, typically speaking, is, is to fit a saddle that has a pressure relief channel. Uh, they come in a million and one different shapes and sizes, but uh, that, that would be the best way of, of, of solving issues like that, in my opinion. On the grounds that you're still able to provide support to the pelvis, but it's relieving any, any sort of pressure from erogenous areas. For the most part, we want to try and get a saddle relatively level, but and th there isn't a, a general rule for how much pitch should be applied to each saddle, because it varies from saddle to saddle. An Arion like this, I would potentially, well, most people would never leave my studio with one of these, but uh, I'd potentially fit this with a maximum of one, one to one and a half degrees of nose down. When we're measuring saddle pitch in here to keep it consistent, we tend to measure across the two widest points. So if you take a saddle like an SMP, uh, we would measure between the two highest points. So, I mean, we, we have <laughs> a, a saddle pitch tool, which is basically a, a magnetic clipboard with a digital spirit level on it, um, which allows us to measure uh, saddle pitch. So it, it, it varies, but ultimately what we, what we don't want is to be generating a huge slope in order for you to fall off the front of the saddle. The second common blunder uh, for consumers and bike shops alike is to size up the shoes in order, in order to accommodate a wide foot. So in a normal dress shoe or a trainer, you can get away with going up a size to accommodate a wider foot because there isn't a, a mechanical element to it. Whereas with a cycling shoe, the cleat location where the cleat is affixed is fixed. You can't really move it to, for the most part. Uh, so the problem with going up a size in the shoe is that as you go up in, in, the, shoe, in the shoe size, the cleat location becomes increasingly further forward. What that does is it puts quite a lot of pressure with the forefoot, uh, there's a very delicate structure of the toe bones, and it tends to cut off circulation to the feet. More importantly, it actually has ramifications in the knees, the hips, and the pelvis. There's a very, very strong correlation between a cleat placement being too far forward and anterior knee pain. That also tends to impact saddle comfort as well. A way of remedying this, you've got to understand uh, have you got wide feet? There's a very simple way of doing that. Look at them. Uh, if you've got wide feet, buy a wide fitting shoe. I think generally the, the best way of remedying this would be to go somewhere that specializes in shoe fitting. We offer a shoe fitting service where every rider is subjected to uh, the feet being measured. We, have, we measure arch collapse and arch drop. We measure the width and then we recommend a shoe based on that rather than just kind of going, oh, I'm a size 10, but you're not a 10, you're an eight with wide feet. Here's a shoe. I see an increasing number of people who watch these videos say, oh, I'm gonna go and buy a pair of legs because I say they're great, and they are, but then they go and buy them online or they go and buy them from a bike shop and they're the wrong size or the wrong shape or it's the wrong lake. Not all lakes are the same. This is a narrower fitting shoe than this, which is a narrower fitting shoe than this. There are a few places uh, throughout the UK that have that understanding, but I think the, the basic takeaway from this is go somewhere where they measure your feet and they have, they have a little bit of an understanding of, 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 shoes and, of shoes and how they differ. Use speed play pebbles to treat knee pain. This is one of the more common blunders that we see in here uh, where, again, kind of bike shops and, and consumers alike tend to recommend this pedal system as a means of, of solving knee issues. Uh, I don't really know how this myth's come about because actually I see potentially more knee issues occurring because of this system than anything else. Certainly they've, they've always been preferred because of uh, quite a lot of adjustment for flow and there's also 
historically has been a plethora of different options. So for example, you used to be able to, before Wahoo over took, took over, um, you used to have different axle lengths, you used to have extender plates that you could adjust the cleat in, in a much more uh, extreme rearward fashion. All of those benefits are no longer available, unfortunately. But uh, I find that the speed play has added complexity, it's, it's very expensive and doesn't solve knee pain. What it might do is help alleviate the symptoms, but my suspicion is usually that the symptoms occur as a result of something else. It's almost always usually multifaceted as well, so uh, we've got a video that we're gonna put there that we've done on eBay. It's an expensive way of trying to solve a problem that frankly probably doesn't need uh, or nor warrant the purchase of any product. You can usually get away with uh, removing knee pain without having to spend loads and loads and loads of money. Uh, so I, I would probably avoid. So something we quite often see with bikes that come straight out of a bike shop uh, in their kind of pre-delivery fit or setup is that the handlebars are rolled up like so as a means of reducing the reach. The main negative to this is that it renders the drops unusable because you, you, can't, you can't stay on them. Uh, but it also means that you can't reach the brake levers when you're on the drops. Uh, and ultimately, it just looks rubbish. So the way that we would recommend you go about doing it is, well, you can reduce the reach in a number of ways. We can change the stem length, we can change the handlebar. The handlebar itself, it's worth noting that the reach of the handlebar, so this distance where from the center of the bore to where the control is located, differs from handlebar to handlebar. Some of them, I mean, there could be as much as 30 to 40 millimeters difference, and then how the control is located on the handlebar will also influence up to 20 mil uh, within that as well. This shouldn't really be carried out. It's generally indicative of a bike or a position that's just too long. It's not particularly stable, and as, I, as I've said, it renders the controls not particularly effective. The way we would go about doing it, a great way of, of um, reducing reach on the bike without having to necessarily roll the handlebars up is to change the control location on the handlebar. Now, first and foremost, what you've got to do is to start this is you've got to unwrap the top of the bar all the way down to just below the shifter. Uh, if you take a five millimeter Allen key, it's easier with a P-handle like this. Uh, peel the hood back, and this is only on Shimano, by the way. Well, actually, no, it's, it, Shimano and SRAM both have a five millimeter Allen key behind the hood. Campagnolo uses a Torx T, I think it's T25, and you'll basically want to loosen the lever and you can then adjust kind of where the shifter is on the handlebar. So a good rule, and this is, you know, I don't like generalizations and rules of thumb, but this, is, this could be a good one for you. Get the bore, or sorry, let's get the end of the handlebar level, right? So make sure you're doing this when the bike is level, it's on, it's on a, so you don't have one part of the bike elevated, it's gotta be completely level. Get the bottom of the bar level, and then you have your control location set up with a, a mild amount of, of rise at the front in this case, um, in, in this way. Uh, what that will do is it will potentially offset the reach as much as possible. When I say reach, I'm talking about the reach from, of, of, of the handlebar itself. Uh, so what, what we're gonna do is once we've locked our, our bar, our handlebar rotation in place, I'm just gonna do that quickly. Where you have the angle of the control to a certain extent, it's down to personal preference. There are some people that say that it should be perpendicular with the ground. I disagree because it tends to result in a rolling of the wrist, which creates neck and shoulder and arm tension. Uh, I like a little bit of rise to the shift to the to the lever, um, so that, as I said earlier, that you it, it, it kind of has a nice soft interaction with with the hand when you present it to the lever. Got that in place, and away you go. To demonstrate how much of a difference this this can influence, if I put this back down again. This bar's got the uh, shifter set in, you know, quite a common place. Uh, I see, you know, I see a lot of bar bikes coming in with the, with the, with the levers set up like this. And to demonstrate uh, how much of a difference the reach can be, if look at the reach. So this lever is 69 and a half centimeters versus 67 centimeters. So it's a 25 millimeter change in reach without you having to, even, having to even change anything on the, hand, on the bike. So it's, uh, it's a really cost-effective way of, of reducing the reach and making the bike a lot more comfortable for you. It will also mean that you can reach the brake levers when you're on the drops without necessarily having to uh, rely on the reach adjustment of the brake lever. Most, most brake levers have reach adjustment on them. Uh, and that's it, really. 
So this kind of leads us on to putting very short stem, uh, very short stems on bikes, and what that tends to do is negatively impact the handling. So the bike tends to feel very unstable at high speed. If you're having to put a very short stem on a bike, have a go at doing this first. But there are other ways of improving or optimizing the reach of a bicycle. Quite often, it can be that it isn't to do with the front end of the bike at all. So, for example. If you have a saddle that results in posterior rotation of the pelvis, in English, uh, rather than sitting with a, a relatively neutral spine like so, what happens a lot of the time when we have soft tissue pressure applied is we rotate the pelvis away. What that tends to result in is excessive spinal flexion. So it makes it much more, it basically essentially shortens your spine, which makes the reach to the handlebars much more difficult. So it could be that we either need to fit a saddle that offers sufficient pressure relief, or in some cases it can just be bad habit. You know, everyone, it's no different to sitting at a desk like this or walking down the street like this. Some people just get into the bad habit of sitting on a bike like they sit on a toilet. So it might be that you need to kind of prompt yourself to anteriorly rotate your pelvis. What that results in is, well, a number of things. Firstly, as we've discussed, it lengthens your spine, lengthens your torso, and improves your reach to the handlebars. It also, uh, it tend, tends to be better, and there's, there's gonna be a video coming up on this soon, it, it tends to be better for your, your lower back. It's also gonna be conducive to good glute enlistment. Glutes are your biggest muscle group. Uh, they're the your primary extensors, one of your primary extensors. So actually, you might find you get a little bit more power as well. So there you go, that marks the end of today's episode of Bike Fit Tuesdays. If you would like to find out more about bike fitting stuff, uh, then head to James's website if you'd like to get a fit from him as well. Put any questions that you have into the comment section down below and we'll do our best to answer them. Equally, if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover in future episodes of Bike Fit Tuesdays, put that in the comment section down below. Thank you, goodbye.